Okay, we're getting ready to start now. Nancy Sosa is our speaker. She hails from Tombstone here. Is it on? I'm not sure it's on. It's getting feedback from the computer. Oh. He'll fix it for you, Riz. That better? Yeah. yeah, there we got it. Nancy Sosa hails from Tombstone. She is a historical researcher and preservationist, correct? And um, she's been with the, I met her at the Tombstone Territory Rendezvous, which she has very active in and done a lot of stuff for. And I'm gonna turn it over to her to talk about our Rontau Cabin. Thanks, Liz. Thank you all for having me here today. It's been quite a pleasure to come here. Um, I need you guys to use your imagination very quickly. You can close your eyes, you can close out the world, you can close out the fact of where we're sitting. And I want you to think just about empty space. And 160 years ago, what you think this area may have looked like. And Imagine, if you will, some rolling hills and grass and not very many mesquite trees because that came a little bit later. No cottonwoods on the San Pedro River. Just nice, clean, pristine, empty land. I want you to think about that. And we just have our Apaches, our Mexicans, our Yaqui Indians. That's what you have. You have very few people in this area 160 years ago. And just think about that. And then think about where we're standing right now. We're standing in one of the most historic Western towns in the world. More often than not, you say Tombstone, and everybody says Wyatt Earp, or Doc Holliday, or the OK Corral. They always talk about silver and a gunfight. And even sometimes Ed Shefflin will come into that. <laughs> but what if, what if that story was written different? What if you knew details about the tombstone story? Just think about that when you think about that empty space. We're here in historic Shefflin Hall a magnificent structure that was built in honor of Tombstone's founder. But what if the whole history behind Tombstone had been written differently? What if we were supposed to honor a different person? Someone who had given up everything he knew to travel to the other side of the world to start all over again. A man with an explorer's heart and an adventurous spirit. A man who was murdered in the prime of his life, and whose story no one has been able to deliver accurately. What if we were finally able to recognize the one person who made all of this possible? What if Frederick Brunkow had founded the Silver Mining District first, instead of his final resting place? To first understand the man behind the myth, we must look at what has been written and discussed for over 160 years. Crumbling ruins on the side of a well-traveled road, whispers of murder and ghosts, frightening tales of horror and potential crime scene of the century just a few miles from where we are standing. It has been written that Frederick Brokow and two other men were brutally murdered by Mexicans or Apaches on the 23rd of July of 1860 at the Bronco Mines. That Brokow had been found in the bottom of a shaft with a drill shoved through his belly. People say they see ghostly figures walking the ruins or digging with his axe looking for his lost silver and fortune. 
While it's true that Brunkow and two of his colleagues were murdered that fateful day, almost none of the other portions of those stories are accurate. And we are doing a great injustice by repeating those stories. We're going to start with Brunkow's past. Germany, 1948. A series of revolutions against European monarchs began in January of 1848. Starting in Sicily and spreading to Italy, France, Germany, and Austria. In other countries, it was more a quiet demonstration with eventual reforms of existing institutions. But some democratic insurrections broke out in major cities, such as Paris, Vienna, and Berlin. While the revolution was successful in France, others ended in failure with further re repressions and repercussions. The King of Prussia refused the title of emperor offered to him. He sought to achieve the unity of Germany by a union between the German princes. Austria and Russia compelled him to abandon his design, and absolute monarchy was reestablished in these countries. The citizens who had rebelled were punished or forced to flee their homeland. New Bronze fell in Kamal County, Texas. It had been established in 1845 as part of several communities associated with the German emigrant migration developed and encouraged by several German nobility. It all started with Baron de Bestrup, a Prussian by birth who served under Frederick the Great, as well as the King of Spain. It was the King of Spain who went to the Baron and asked him to go to Texas in 1821. But the German settlement in Texas is another story. We'll focus on the fact that many of the original German settlers of Texas immigrated from Prussia. Saxony and other such prominent areas also yielded highly educated German immigrants to our area. These hardy settlers would establish and develop many communities near San Antonio, Austin, and further encourage their fellow countrymen and women to settle in Texas. They are called the 48ers. The 48ers were refugees of the failed German Revolution of 1848. They were idealists, highly educated professionals, journalists, merchants, lawyers, and engineers. These free thinkers were desperate to begin again. They were willing to risk the only thing that they had left, their lives. The Gadsden Purchase was a big, major part of that expansion from Texas. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on December 30th of 1853. The treaty brought to an end the war between Mexico and the U.S. and settled the boundaries between the two countries. Present-day Arizona and New Mexico were an integral part of that boundary decision. The Arizona and New Mexico territories, they have changed incredibly since 1853. If you didn't know before, you're going to know now. It used to be New Mexico and Arizona. And Arizona was just this little tiny afterthought. And then it became bigger and we were more equally divided. And eventually we became Arizona and New Mexico, the way you see it now. A number of companies petitioned the federal government to allow exploration in the area within the Gadsden Purchase. Many of the companies were railroad and mining based. German engineer Hermann Ehrenberg was one of these men. The Texas and Pacific Railroad had given Ehrenberg $100,000 to open mines in the newly acquired territory. Ehrenberg went directly to his fellow German immigrants and recruited the best of the best in all fields related to mining. This included geologists, 
mineralogists, engineers, carpenters, wheelwrights, smelter operators, and general laborers. Among those men was a very highly educated Frederick Brunkow. Frederick was born in Prussia in 1820. He received his primary and elementary education in his hometown of Westphalia. He then moved on to higher education in Berlin. Brokow graduated from the Royal Mining Academy at Berlin in 1843. By 1847, he was examining the mines in Saxony and learning more than he ever wanted to learn about how mines could operate worldwide. In 1848, Brunkow was involved in the rebellion in Prussia. He left Saxony in March and went home because that was what he needed to do. When the rebellion failed, he boarded the first boat he could find and sailed to Galveston, Texas. Brunkow made his way to New Bronzeville, where thousands of 48ers were now refugees. It was in New Bronzeville that Brunkow met Ehrenberg and his fate was sealed. Exploration of the Gadsden Purchase began in 1854 in January. By April of 1854, Brunkow found himself in the company of good men at a camp site in Tubac. They started in San Antonio and Austin made their way to El Paso, made their way across the New Mexico territory, and went all the way, interestingly enough, to Yuma, where Major Heitzelman had established Yuma and Colorado City. Heitzelman was another integral part of what was going to happen in Tuvok. The exploration had determined to take over a few of the abandoned sites in Tuvok, Tumacapuri, and Arapaca Ranch and several abandoned Mexican mines. Ehrenberg, Charles Poston, Major Heitzelman, and William Wrightson searched for the investors and soon established the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company. The most prominent and key financial investor was none other than Samuel Colt. Frederick Brokow was listed as the geologist, mineralogist, and mining engineer of the Sonora branch of the company. Brokow would be a key part of the company, locating two of the most prominent mines in the company, the Heitzelman Mine, named after his good friend Heitzelman, on February 1st of 1857, and the Sierra Colorado Mine, also in 1857. A sample from the Heitzelman mine yielded a, what would now be valued as a $30,000 sample in silver. Brokow would later become the administrator of the Sierra Colorado mine and lived there for nearly three years. In 1859, Brunkow personally submitted his report to the investors at New York and Cincinnati. He talked about the main office at Tubac and the Santa Rita Mountains in the distance. He discussed the operations of the Heitzelman mine, which started out, as you can see by the engraving, as just a tent. That was 1855. By 1857, they had full structures at the Heitzelman mine, including a smelter, a blacksmith shop, wheelwright, and a company store. In 1859, the map of the Gadsden Purchase changed. It showed all the mines up to that point that pertained to the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company. They had taken over several of the mines that had been abandoned by the Mexicans and had started exploration as far as the San Pedro River especially near the ruins by Terranate and further south to the new border with Mexico. These are the offices of the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company at the Tubac Presidio. If you went to TTR last year and you got to walk around where the offices once stood. 
1853 map of the Gadsden Purchase, which is misdated, to be honest, because in Brunkow's report, he has the map. And in Brunkow's 1856 report, that map is dated as June of 1854. So through Brunkow's own words and his own maps and his own interpretation of things, we know that he was in the San Pedro area near where he located the San Pedro mines as early as June of 1854. Over the next few years, the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company would suffer financial loss. So much that Samuel Colt visited the company headquarters to see himself the financial losses the company was facing. It was said he wanted to just throw the money in the mines and dig it back up because that's the only way he was going to get it back. The ever-deepening debt and the lack of control by Charles Poston and Ehrenberg caused Colt to lose complete faith in them. In December of 1858, Brunkhaus admitted his intent to resign from the company to Heitzelman. Although Brunkhaus did not appear to follow through with the resignation until several months later, because in the summer of 1859, Brunkhaus admitted his resignation to Samuel Colt in person. Brunkhaus wanted to move away from the failing company and follow up on some other mining prospects near the San Pedro River. Samuel Colt did not want to lose the best geologist he had and encouraged Brunkow to only resign his position at the Sierra Colorado mine. Brunkow agreed, and with Colt's blessings and some possible financial backing, Brunkow located several mines in the San Pedro River Valley just south of the old mission site of Terranate, which is now in ruins above Fairbank. We do know from Brunkhouse 1860 report in March to the Sonora Exploring Mining Company, he was still helping Samuel Colt because he is a part of that 1860 report on those mines, even though he's no longer listed as the company's geologist. Brunkhouse enlisted a few of his company men, the Williams brothers, William and James. James was a prominent machinist and mining engineer from St. Louis, Missouri. William was also a mining engineer, but he was very good at finances as well. He could handle the logistics of the company. James C. Moss had been a senior professor of science at the local high school in St. Louis, a well-known chemist and assayer. Moss was just who Brunkow needed to round out the group. The four set out for the San Pedro mines in the spring of 1860. Brunkow was known to suffer from lead colic, lead poisoning, which is why he needed moss, because he could not do the assaying anymore. The illness caused a great deal of abdominal pain, and often Brunkow missed days of work. Heitzelman noted this illness and days missed at work in letters to Colt and other board members. However, it was also noted by Heitzelman that Brunkow was the best administrator at the Cerro Colorado and at the company, that the laborers and fellow company men highly respected Brunkow. The laborers were predominantly Mexicans. In July of 1860, Brunkow and his associates were struggling to keep the Mexican laborers happily employed. With so many religious festivals going on and the Mexican workers were more absent than working, they didn't know what to do. Supplies would run low and the nearest restock point was at Fort Buchanan, a few days travel from the San Pedro mines. On July 20th, Brunkow hired a cook named David Borntrager. Borntrager had left Santa Cruz mine for unknown reasons and was seeking work. Brunkow hired the fellow German and set him to work on Monday, July 23rd. It was that morning that the horrible murders would take place. I could sit and tell you my interpretation of what happened that day, or I could read it to you. Because there was an investigation at Fort Buchanan. The St. Louis Daily Missouri Republic published on the 31st of August in 1860. 
The Arizona Tragedy. Testimony taken before the public meeting near Fort Buchanan on July 28th. Examination conducted by T. M. Turner and Edward E. Cross. David Borntrager sworn. On the 4th of July, left Santa Cruz, intending to go to the members' gold mines, went as far as Brown's Ranch on the San Pedro, stayed there for some time. Then I changed my mind about going to the mines and started again from Santa Cruz. The second day, camped within three or four miles of the San Pedro mine. Arrived there on Friday, July 20th. Mr. Brumcow asked me where I was going, told him. Finally, he offered me a job of cooking, which I accepted. Knew but one Mexican employed at the mine, Jesus Rodriguez. Knew him first at the Patagonia mine and Santa Cruz. Was working there while they were prospecting a new mine. Never knew of his being run off from that mine for stealing. Did not commence cooking till the morning of the murder, Monday, July 23rd. Saturday and Sunday did nothing. Talked and walked around, but noticed nothing suspicious. Monday morning went into the kitchen and commenced work. Mr. William Williams left after breakfast for Fort Buchanan. After he left, Mr. Brunkow turned over the kitchen and commenced to getting dinner. Brumcow was still there about nine o'clock. B told me he did not notice whether he had his arms or not. Mr. Moss was in the vicinity and Mr. James Williams, who I believe accompanied his cousin on the road, returned. After I had my dinner put to cook, sat reading a novel. Had been reading for an hour or two. Meanwhile, not knowing where Mr. Williams and Moss were, had paid no attention to the movement of the Mexicans. Two Mexicans came into the kitchen and asked permission to light cigarettes. Didn't see any Mexicans loading, loitering around previously to this, and nothing to excite suspicion. Told the Mexicans they could have the lights. At the same time, heard a shot. When I jumped for the door and both men grabbed me, the shots appeared to come from the storeroom. I tried to get away while struggling. Four or five other shots were fired close by, and one of the men, apparently in the storeroom, called out as if in pain. When the Mexicans grabbed me, they took my pistol from me, did not know whether they had knives. They were struggling, and after the shooting had ceased, a Jesus Rodriguez rushed in and said, do not hurt him. Let him loose. Do not be afraid. We will not harm a hair on your head. They let me loose. When I walked out the door and saw all the Mexicans standing around with arms, some had pistols, some rifles, some double barrel shotguns. About 11 men were there and no women. They immediately commenced to plundering the house, packing the goods on the animals, and saw them pack seven animals. I think it was goods and merchandise. When Rodriguez told the men to let me go, they did so without any remonstrance whatsoever. If he told me the reason they did not kill me was that he had known me for a long time, knew that I only came to the mine to work, that Brunkow had frequently cursed the Mexicans, and that they had received no rations for some time. The Mexicans were about half an hour in loading up the animals. I standed by looking on. When they loaded, Jesus told me to come along. He said, I must go with them to Sonora. When he told me, the men set me loose. What can I do? I'm alone, without arms. The woman helped to pack, but looked very scared and pale. Heard nothing said about getting fire to the houses. Saw James William lying on the floor of the storehouse. He appeared to be dead. Asked no questions to the Mexicans as we went around the house. I saw Mr. Moss lying on the ground, partially on his face, apparently dead. Did not hear or see anything of Mr. Brunkow. Started up the San Pedro Valley, saw some of the men carrying packs. I followed on all day, closely watching by as a man with a gun, but said nothing to me. 
The Mexicans were talking all the time, but I heard very little they said as I was behind them camped three or four miles from the San Pedro Ranch. The Mexicans thought they were above the ranch. After the camp was made, most of them laid down, one stood guard. The next morning about daylight, I asked Jesus to let me go to the San Pedro Ranch. He said I might go. I told him I wanted to go to Fort Buchanan to report the murder. Though I was afraid of my life and all the time, Jesus did not say anything. I traveled down the river a mile or so. I went down the hill and saw the ranch was not too far below. I followed on after the Mexicans who had gone up river, and after a time found them at the ranch cooking breakfast. They were camped just outside the building. As they came up, Elias came up, and after shaking hands, invited me into the house to eat something. Asked where I was from, I told him I was from the San Pedro Mines, but nothing about the murder. After a while, I spoke to him about the murder. The Mexicans that were there, they told him the whole story said there ought to be a treaty between the two governments to dissolve and deliver up criminals. I agreed with him and told him also that the Mexicans had stolen from the mine. He made no reply and left me. After Elias left me, I sat a while and went out to the yard. I heard Elias and Jesus Rodriguez and the Mexican named Angelo taking me in the other room. I listened and heard them tell Elias about the murder and the robbery and the cause of it. And they said I was innocent. Jesus had saved my life. I went outside the yard and the Mexicans were packing up to leave. Did not see the Mexicans sell or give anything away at the San Pedro ranch that had been stolen. I then had another talk with Elias and tried to hire a horse to go to the fort. He said he had five horses but only two fit to ride and he could not spare them. We arrived at the ranch on Tuesday, and I stayed up until Thursday on account of my feet, which were so sore I couldn't walk. Elias said that he could take the murderers the way he was situated. He said his brother had gone below for provision and taken part of their men. On Thursday evening, I started for Santa Cruz, telling Elias I intended giving the information of the murder to the people there. I reached Santa Cruz about 1 or 2 o'clock on Friday morning. I went to the house of Alcaro, whose name is Placido. A man named Fox also lived there. I waked up the people in the house and told them of the murder. They were astonished, said it was awful. I slept there until morning when I went to the house of an American named Thomas Gardner and asked him to let me have a horse, also telling him about the murder. He was perfectly thunderstruck, said he had just come home on his horse, which was very poor, but would help me hunt one up. There are so many inconsistencies with Warren Trigger's statement. I tore it apart piece by piece. Nothing is consistent about anything that he says. He says there were shots fired. He says he didn't see knives. He says that there were no women there, but then he says that the women were packing all of the provisions. He gets confused about where the ranches were and what direction he was going, because on the map, Brown's Ranch is on the map. So everybody knew where the ranch was. He's just talking as if nobody's going to pay attention to what he says. And then Williams talks. William M. Williams sworn. I came to the San Pedro mine on the 17th of June, 1860, and was employed as the storekeeper, bookkeeper, etc. We had 10 men and one boy employed at the time of the murder. The Americans consisted of Frederick Brokow, mining engineer, James Williams, machinist, and John C. Moss, the assayer and chemist, beside myself. Had been short of flour at times, but when we could not ration them with flour, we issued an equivalent. Expecting the flour on the 23rd day of the murder we had. When I started for Fort Buchanan for supplies, expecting to be absent for a week or 10 days, intending if provisions could not be procured at the post to go to Sonora. The man, David Brunkow, came to the mine on Friday morning. He stated he had been at the gold mines and pretended to describe the state of things. I returned to the mines with supplies on Thursday night. Arriving after midnight, found James William, 
dead in the storeroom, did not succeed in finding any other bodies that night. After riding around and examining the premises, concluded to return to the fort. Mr. H's two sons were with me. We arrived at the post about dawn and returned to the mine immediately with a party of troops. When we arrived at the mine, we found Mr. Moss's body about 60 yards south of the building, which is from the perspective the first picture is taken. It was very much decayed. Mr. James Williams' body lay in the storeroom, also much decayed. The wounds appeared to be on the back principally. Mr. Brunkow's body lay at the Cabello vein, also much decayed. Most of the prints, fancy goods, and clothing, knives, arms, and ammunition had been taken, and the trunks were all broken open. The dead were buried by the soldiers. David Bortrager's clothing and blanket lay on a box in the storeroom when I left. When I returned, they were gone, but the cape of his overcoat, which later lay near the box. I'd never seen Mr. Brokow ill treat a Mexican, nor any of the other men do so. Never heard of any of the Mexicans complain of the wages or their treatment. After David Borntrigger came to the mine, he was with the Mexicans most of the time. On Sunday, Jesus Rodriguez had a new lance and was practicing with it, throwing it. There was no appearance of any scuffle near the dead men, nor in the kitchen where David was. The book, which I suppose he had been reading, was turned down on the shelf. Do not think these three men could have scuffled much in the kitchen without leaving evidence of it. The Mexicans took our four horses with saddles and bridles from the mine. Do not think there was much work done on Monday morning, the day of the murder. David Bortrigger was hired by Mr. Brunkow to cook. Williams later gave another interview at some point after he had more thoroughly digested Warren Traeger's rendition of what happened. He specifically talks about Rodriguez having a new lance. While Warren Traeger said that there was a lot of gunfire going on, Williams said, I was still close enough to the mines. I would have heard the gunfire. There was no gunfire. The men were not shot. The men were killed with knives. Next came Sergeant Henderson. Captain Ewing was in charge, Ewell, I'm sorry, Captain Ewell was in charge of Fort Buchanan. He could not conduct the investigation and inquiry because he had a financial investment in the San Pedro mine. He was one of Brokow's investors. So somebody without a financial investment had to conduct the investigation. I am a sergeant in Company G, 1st Dragoons, was detailed on Friday morning, July 27th, to go to the San Pedro mine with 20 men, arrived with Mr. Williams at 12 and a half o'clock, found the body of Mr. Williams in the storeroom, very much decayed, evidently mortally wounded, and killed without a struggle. The body of Mr. Moss was found in the rear of the storehouse at a distance of 40 or 50 yards. Marks of two stabs on his body, one in the back, the other between the shoulders. His body was greatly mutilated by coyotes and also much decayed. Sent out to the two guides to hunt the trail of murderers to see if the bodies could be found, as we supposed there were still two missing. The guides returned and Mr. Williams accompanied them to a vein where buzzards were seen hovering around and found the body of Mr. Brunkow in the shaft, partially eaten by coyotes. All the bodies had been robbed. Could only recognize them by their clothing and general appearance, their features being entirely changed. We buried the bodies and the next morning, I assisted Mr. Williams in taking inventory of the property remaining. From the amount on the invoice and the amount remaining, I should think nine-tenths of the merchandise had been taken. The machinery appeared to be undisturbed. Examine the room where Mr. James Williams was found with several of my men. We could not see any evidence of bullets in the walls. His body had one wound, which we thought was a bullet hole, but the body was too much decay, decay to pronounce with certainty. 
a stab between the shoulders was evidently his death blow. It looked as though the bow had been given from behind. The weapon had gone through his body, killing him instantly. It is impossible that any scuffle could have taken place between David and the two captors in the kitchen, which is very small, without causing great confusion. The room was neat, and a novel was lying on the shelf. Also a pipe, filled, but not lit. Later on, about six weeks, there was a report in one of the newspapers that Jesus Rodriguez and three of the other Mexicans had been arrested because of what David Borntrager had said. The governor of Sonora struck a deal with the federal agencies in the territory, saying, I'll return them if next time you do that in kind. There's nothing else written about it. Quite possibly because Henderson said they didn't do it. We don't know how much David Borntrager had to do with it, but the events that he said in his testimony did not line up with the evidence that was given. When we stand here and we think about Tombstone, we automatically think about Ed Shefflin, Richard Hurd, Albert Shefflin. There's something interesting that I found out in doing this research on Bruckow. He had 17 years of experience in geology, mineralogy, and mining engineer. He came here to start a new life in a hostile country after participating in a failed rebellion. He competed with thousands of German immigrants for work, for housing, and for a future. There were 4,048 ers that left Prussia alone. That's who he had to compete with. He made a decision to join Ehrenberg and come to the new territory. We celebrate Shefflin or Brunkow because I found out something curious. When Ed came here in 1877, he connected with two men that were doing the survey assessment of the San Pedro mines. Albert Smith and William Griffith. And they told them all about Brunkow and everything that had happened at the Brunkow mines. They also had Brunkow's reports. Ed, and I'm a big supporter of Ed, <laughs> Ed was an amazing prospector. But there is a difference between a prospector and a miner. I do not honestly feel at this point Ed would have found what he found if he hadn't abused what Brunkow left behind. If you knew the details behind Shefflin's discovery, you might rethink on giving the credit. Brunkow knew the potential of the area in 1854. He knew the potential of the silver because he came here and made a run of it in 1860. He spoke of it often in letters to members of the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company. He even wrote about it in potential letters to Ehrenberg, Heitzelman, and Lewis, and then how do you say that name? Quesit. The smelter operator at Sierra, Colorado. And there are plenty of those letters. Ron found one, and I found six more. If Brokow had lived, he would have completed his mineral survey of the San Pedro River Valley and found the mother load that Shefflin was later credited with. Respectfully, Shefflin did discover the silver veins. He did discover the mother load, but it was after somebody else had already done the work. Everything that was written about Brunkow from the finding of the silver here in 1877, they always mention the cabin. Shefflin admits to using the cabin, and Richard Gerd admits to using the stove and the chimney and everything in there so that they could smelt the ore. They knew about it. They were there. It was their headquarters. 
because they knew where to look. And I don't feel that Brokaw is given enough credit. So what if, what if Brokaw lived? What if David Borntrager never went to that mine? I don't think we would be standing in Shefflin Hall. I think we would be standing somewhere else. And honestly, I think we look more like San Antonio or New Braunfels or Austin or even Tucson or Phoenix. We would have grown because the only thing he had left to lose was his life. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? I do. Yes. How old was Born Trader? From his accounts, he was in his 30s. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I did track down Jesus Rodriguez through a bit of the mining records. And there are some, I didn't get everything in time. There are some records of employees in several different collections that pertain to the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company. And in many of those reports, the biggest argument that is made about the Mexican employees is they were always taking off for festivals. If it wasn't a birthday, it was a wedding. If it wasn't a wedding, it was a christening. If it wasn't a christening, it was, you know, Corpus Christi or it was Christmas. Easter was a big deal. And many of them were going to the Pueblos or going back into Sonora to celebrate with families. But they never really complained about the rationings because one of the things that Ehrenberg and Heitzelman and Brunkow and even Poston allowed them to do their own hunting, gave them the ammunition to do it, in most cases gave them the weapons. The reason they were able to do that is because when Colt invested in the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company, it wasn't just money. It was $10,000 worth of Colt weapons and munitions. And he gave them to them regularly. So everybody was well armed. And what struck me the most about the investigation is everything that Warren Trigger said, it just, from the moment I started, reeked of nonsense. Just absolute nonsense. But there's more, there's a lot more. I'm not done yet. It's kind of been a rabbit hole. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. No, he, so one of the mines that he first found that he named in the vicinity was called the Kawabi. And it, it took me a while to, um, in the newspaper, uh, I want to say it was in 57, they put a list of all the mines of the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company. And that mine is on there. And when you look at the location description and where it was at, it's in the San Pedro River Valley. And according to Williams' um, later interviews and what he was saying about the San Pedro mines, there were four different mines at that particular location. And they, they aren't, you look at the picture, and you can see what's left of the storeroom. There's just that little tiny portion of that wall. And then what's left of the house, the main house. So they did sit right next to each other. And like Williams had said later on, if he had heard that fire, it would have carried. I don't know how many of you have been out at the Brunk cow, but it sits up on the hill. And when you're up there, even now, you can hear everything around you. So. If there had been gunfire, they would have been in the air, especially in that close proximity. But yeah, yes. How long have the ghost stories gone on about that, about people having experiences up there? Was that from the very beginning or is that kind of No, that didn't start until, um, who's the guy that wrote uh, when the West was young? 
Frederick Bechtel came here and wrote a series of articles. And Brunkow's cabin is mentioned quite often. It's often called the Bronco or the Bronco Mine. And by the way, that was never a name of any in mines. Um, it started with the 1920s articles and people talking about, oh yeah, that all these, and there were a lot of murders there. Don't get me wrong. Duffield was killed out there. Um, Van Houten, Van Houten was killed out there. But for them to talk about Brunkow the way they do, it's awful. They say that he was shoved in the bottom of the mine with a drill shoved all the way through his belly. He was severed in half. I mean, that's not doing any kind of respect to what really took place. And it, it started in the 20s. And it kind of, a lot of things about Tombstone started in the 20s. It kind of just progressed from there. But near as I can tell, and I spent six weeks trying to collect everything that was ever written about Frederick Brunkow, it all started with, interestingly enough, Charles Poston's In Memoriam in the newspaper. He totally gets Brunkow completely wrong. He says he landed in New York, that he went all the way across to Philadelphia, that he sailed down the Mississippi and did all this nonsense, and he was a shingle maker in Texas when he found him. So the fanciful stories start about that time. You had a question back there? Well, the, we've always heard it's the bloodiest cabin in southern Arizona. I've only heard mention of five names that were there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear, and I'd love to say this, did you ever hear the difference between a historian and a historical researcher? <laughs> a historian is his story. He's telling you a story based on a lot of facts. But he wants to entertain you. He wants to get your attention. He wants you to get you to do more, to read more. And then his story gets turned into a lot of other things. A historical researcher, I'm just going to give you my pile of stuff and let you figure it out. But I think Rory Young may have come up with, how many did he count? I think it is 27, to be honest. I think it is 27 people that we're aware of in the area, but only seven at the actual site. But in, in the area, which I would say, what, three square miles, there's like 27 people. But you can see how that story gets convoluted and changed constantly over time. I mean, they left out the part where Shefflin ran into the ass stairs of the mine and got the paperwork. So why not leave out everything else? Yes. Did you run into Tom Jeffords claim? No, not yet. Uh, spring of 1875, uh, he laid claim to the property with, and his partners, Ochoa and others, gathered up most of the hillside. In 1883, he still had his, his brother John guarding the mine. I think once the attention came to the district and the district was actually established, the people who were fighting to keep their claims on the San Pedro, because um, Brown eventually lost his ranch. Um, his son and grandson had taken over the ranch and he eventually lost that. I think he lost it to Green. But most of the people in the area were trying to, there was a lot of claim jumping going on. And they would claim the mine and rename the mine. They changed one little number on it. Usually it was the location description that was altered just enough, kind of like what Charles Poston used to do. You alter it just enough, and all of a sudden the mine claim is mine instead of box. Thank you. Yes, hold on, don't, don't lay on the shed. <laughs> okay, and if you can stop the share and stop the recording.